Well, hey, everybody, welcome back. It's another episode of Dr. Movie, and I do have, again, another special guest. My first special guest I had before, well, I guess you can't technically say that because I did have some other shows. When I started off the show, I had some special guests. But since this reiteration of the show, the only person that's been on here with me so far, well, in the first episode, who knows after that because I haven't got there yet. <laughs> but it's the one and only Dan Bone again from Podcast on Haunted Hill and Blame It on the Aliens, which I forgot to bring up the first time, but he told us all about it. But he's back again. What's up, Back Dan? again. I'm back. Hey, how back. you doing? Nice one. I am again, once again, I'm Captain Chaos to your JJ McClure. Uh, we are here driving along the Cannibal Run. <laughs> Cannibal. <laughs> Hell of a movie and probably one we should talk about at some point as well. Let's put that in the book. <laughs> we can do you that. You heard it here first, folks. But That's we're right. not here for that. I could do that and part two. Who knows? Oh, <laughs> There's a whole other spin-off bunch of those, isn't there? Like the Gumball yeah. Rally and a lot of other, ton of other stuff as well. Which I, yeah, I we probably won't it. get that far. <laughs> <laughs> Just keep they, to the ones with Jackie Chan in them. Right. That's that's kind of where I'm at on those. Yeah. Speaking of Jackie Chan, who is in some of these movies we're going to talk about today. Yeah. We're going to talk about the legendary. Now, this is not a, a movie episode. We're just going to talk about uh, Bruce Lee in general. Um, we are going to highlight... The movies. Now, when we talk about Bruce Lee, I mean, I'm, we're not talking about the movies he was in when he was a kid. We're talking about the iconic martial arts classics, the uh, the Golden Harvest, uh, Warner Brothers flicks that just totally changed martial arts movies forever. Mm-hmm. Even to this day, mm-hmm. you're still ripping off Bruce Lee. I don't care who you are. It, it's This is where it started. Um, what's, what's your first... What was your first exposure, even just kind of name wise of what Bruce Lee is or was to you, Dan? Well, I it was linked in with Jackie Chan. Um, Jackie Chan is one of my biggest heroes. I've met Jackie Chan five times in my life. Whoa. I'm very blessed to have done that. Um, but the reason I liked him, funny enough, was because I saw him first in the Cannibal Run. That then got me into... I really liked Kung Fu, Kung Fu movies. So my dad yeah. started showing me, um, uh, you know, uh, I think Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires, which is a Hammer Horror movie, oh, yeah. <laughs> which crossed over with um, the Shaw Brothers, which is a whole other crazy world <laughs> stuff that happened there. And then he started showing me, um, you know, I knew about Big Trouble in Little China and, and, and I just loved watching Kung Fu. And he said to me, it was around about the time he showed me the thing John Carpenter's The Thing. So that was a bit of a coming of age thing because he let me watch that with him when I was probably a bit too young for it. But because he was with me on the sofa, you know, he's going to protect me. And I was a bit scared, but it was all good. So around about that time, because in the in the UK, these Bruce Lee movies were all rated 18 because there was there was boobs in them and there was some death blows to the throat. Oh, yeah. And all these kind of, you know, ripping out people's eyes or whatever it is. He said, if you like Kung Fu. I'm going to show you some Bruce Lee movies. And he had them all on VHS. Yeah. I said, oh, OK. Uh, so we, we sat there together and we watched. I think one of the first ones we watched, weird, we didn't we didn't, didn't watch them in the chronological order. I think it was probably Way of the Dragon, because I remember, yeah. um, which I think in the US is called Chinese Connection. Chinese Connection, yeah. Uh, and that's the one where it's all in Rome. Um, all takes place in Rome. Chuck Norris is in it as well, isn't it? Actually, that's Re- Return of the Dragon here. Ah, okay. Sorry. Return of the Dragon. I I prefer that title, actually. But because Chuck Norris was in it as well, I was like, wow, this is, I've never seen anything like this. Who is this guy? And then he started showing me all the other ones. And of course, I fell in love with what is, what I consider to be the greatest martial arts movie of all time, which is Enter the Dragon, which we will definitely be talking about. Um, And I watched Enter the Dragon, I would say, I would probably say almost a hundred times in my life. Yeah, yeah, uh, I'm right there with you. It's like a finger pointing to the moon. That I can quote every scene from that movie, yeah. and often do. You know, often do with my dad or whoever is around me that knows the movie. It's one of those things, you know. Yeah. Boards don't punch back. <laughs> Bolo, even just saying Bolo. Bolo. <laughs> Bruce Lee, what an absolute legend. Yeah. Um, and the last thing I'll say um, before you, I let you take over your own show again is he's also he's one of those 
he's one of those pop culture that they, they, he transcends what it is he does he he's up there with you know you get t-shirts with Che Guevara Bruce Lee Jimi yeah. Hendrix even though I would probably put like um Freddie Mercury you know some of these people that are just bigger they, they're stars they're just yeah. destined to be more than just what they are um and, and which is crazy because he died at such a young age yeah. and only made a handful of movies it makes you think what on earth could his career have been right right yeah i mean uh, is there a is there a more iconic movie than enter the dragon you know in, in the martial arts world probably not uh I, I would say there isn't yeah and i mean again i if you're a fan of mortal Kombat, guess what you're watching enter the dragon just with mm-hmm. different people in it <laughs> and different things right you know you didn't i mean these are actual hand-to-hand type combats but uh you know my exposure and Kind of like you're talking about, he was already a legend when I was a kid because he'd already passed. You know, mm-hmm. before before End of the Dragon hit the big screen, he was already gone. Yeah. And my first exposure to Bruce Lee, I had a Bruce Lee action figure wow. at the age of four years old. And I literally remember sitting in a theater and us seeing End of the Dragon for the first time. And I'm doing the doll to do all the things that Bruce Lee's doing, right? Amazing. He was he was that big of an icon that I knew who he was before I even saw him in anything. Right. I mean, that's just how ingrained he was in, in everything you do. Of course, you know, you got to remember, there, it's kind of like we were talking earlier before the show started about how we pass things on and how, that's, how everything's related, right? Uh, I had an uncle that was a huge Elvis fan. And somewhere in there, I guess that makes you a huge Bruce Lee fan. Yeah. I guess you think about Elvis getting on the on the stage and doing all his kung fu stuff, you know, yeah. which he was heavy into that. It was so ingrained in the 70s that, you know, in almost every movie, I mean, you even had Roger Moore trying to do martial arts stuff. <laughs> That's how big a phenomenon it came. And it all happened because of Bruce Lee. Let's just be real about it. I mean, That's right, true. yeah, because you had all the Shaw brother movies way before all this. Right. Which you brought that up all ago. My comfort food whenever I'm sick. And I'm stuck at home. Nothing makes me more comfortable than just sitting down and breaking out the old Shaw brother flicks and just yeah. going through them, man. I love them. I, I, I love the, the the worse the dubbing, the better for me. Yeah. And it's always the same story. It's always the evil uncle, right? Yeah. <laughs> when it Damn all comes you. down to it, the bad guys, the, it's the, the evil uncle that is, you know, ruined the family name. And that's, you know, who it all comes down to. But uh, th- that even happens in these movies, believe it or not. So we're just going to kind of go through these uh, in kind of release date order. Uh, Fist of Fury, uh, the first one, also known as the big boss. Uh, Bruce Lee is just a a nice young guy who's been told. It's almost like the, I don't know if you're familiar with Kenny Rogers' song, Coward of the County. <laughs> I, I know it. I do know Everyone the song. Everyone considered him the coward of the county, right? <laughs> where, where his daddy tells him he's not supposed to fight, you know. That doesn't yep. make you a man and you need to, you know, try to stay clean. Well, it's exactly what Bruce Lee is doing in this movie. He's just trying to do his job, make a living. And he finds out that the boss of the place, which is why it's called the big boss, has a, a heroin dealership yep. <laughs> that when you buy a big block of ice, you get some free heroin. It's kind of like DeLorean before it's time. <laughs> <laughs> and that ensues into he's got a promise necklace that he wears. Yeah. And that's what keeps him from breaking his vow. Because every time he gets kind of riled up, he'll grab his necklace and tell him, all right, I got to calm down. Well, he gets in a confrontation. It gets snapped off. The necklace gets stepped off. And then it's on. It's a it's a great MacGuffin, isn't it? Because yes. as a kid, I understood the symbolism. His mum had given him this. His mum had passed and said to him, think of me when there's trouble and there's violence and promise me you'll never. And that was the last promise he ever made. Like you said, every time there's trouble and it happens a few times, there's even one scene where I think somebody scratches his face or something and he just holds the necklace and yep. you can see he's on the verge of hulking out, but then he, right. he comes back down. But like you said, that one scene where the necklace, he, look, he goes to grab it and it's not there because the guys have ripped it off of him. Yep. The Hulk comes out, doesn't it? He, Bruce Lee he, just goes. He's ready to go. And that's what really, set bruce lee mania on fire right i mean uh if you if you see the footage of uh 
the movie Dragon, you know, which is the life story Bruce Bruce Lee. He's he's showing the movie in a theater and he walks out because nobody's making a sound after it ends. So he walks outside. Then all of a sudden there's this eruption of people that are just freaking out on this flick. And uh, immediately he becomes the hero of the country. Mm-hmm. And it's because, you know, he he passes off as. As us, as a normal guy. Right. Uh, these early flicks, it's not about showing off physique or anything, which we get into a little later on. It's about him being a normal person, trying to live a normal life. Consequences happen, and he takes care of business. He was John McClane before John McClane. You know, he's these Perfect kind of characters example. before, yeah. you know, a normal man living in a normal world, just trying to get by, and he gets pushed and pushed and pushed. You just get pushing. You just get pushing me. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. He, yeah. You you made it. That's an excellent point because you think about all these heroes that we've looked at, like that, you know. And mm. it's that that's that thing, right? Pushing the person too far over the edge, and they they react. Everybody loves the underdog story, right? So that's that's where this one is for me. I I love Fist of Fury. It, it it's it has its issues, but it's a first movie done on a very low budget, taking a chance on somebody that was a nobody. I mean the the only respect that he got was you know doing the the green hornet stuff playing kato that's really all he really was basing everything off of now everybody around him knew how awesome he was james colbert yeah. all these guys that were taking lessons from kareem abdul jar um they knew what this guy was and steve mcqueen all of these guys McQueen, you yeah. know he and, was intrinsic. Uh, You're right. He was intrinsic in the 70s um, yes. and the six, late 60s, 70s. Uh, and that's what I think he would. I actually think he would be happy with the legacy he's left because he his guy is very philosophical and he was actually a big hippie. And yeah. all he wanted was everybody just to get along, really, um, no matter what color, no matter who you were. And I think he did bring and has and does continue to bring people together Um you know, whether it's through martial arts or film or whatever it is, because he, he, he just loved everybody and everybody seemed to just love him. Yeah. Except everybody that wanted to challenge him, like on the movie <laughs> sets and stuff. Bolo! Because <laughs> they even had a confrontation, right? Which yeah. they said it didn't last very long. So <laughs> I wouldn't want a confrontation with Bruce Lee, that's no. for sure. <laughs> and that's what they said. You know, they said when, when they started, you know, kind of looking at each other and Bolo was kind of challenging him, the director was like, nope, we're not going to have Bruce like. Just give me a second. Won't take long. <laughs> just just let me get this straightened out. And sure enough, they said within 20 seconds it was over. And it was like, okay, get get cleaned up. Let's go back and shoot the next scene. <laughs> and, that, and that's because he was the real deal. You know, yes. people didn't think that he was, but he was as good as he, and that yeah. comes through. And yeah. I don't know if there's really anybody out there who's got the charisma of him, even in this very first early movie, Right. When he there's electricity when he's on screen, you know, right. he might not be the best actor when it comes to sort of just your, your dramatic acting. I know that, but there's, he's just electric, especially when he is in a fight scene. There's just right. that you feel it. It's just that. Right. Right. And again, fun. you're you're bowling up inside, too, because you're you're feeling this again. You identify with him so much. So when it does kick into gear, you're like, whoa. He he's doing a lot more than I expected. <laughs> and of course, you know, just like every Nintendo video game back in the day, you gotta fight the big boss at the end. You've got right? to. Right. So and I have to admit, uh there's some uh for the time, this got some gruesome stuff in it because he was literally like killing people, chopping up, putting them in ice blocks with the the big boss was. So you're seeing, you know, <laughs> these bodies and these big huge blocks of ice that's being sent through this meal. It's like, mm. wow, this is pretty dark. <laughs> but yeah, you get this big throwdown in the front yard of the big boss's house, and it's just epic, man. And Bruce does that thing where when he finally gets the boss down, he can't stop beating him. I mean, he's he's got the blood all over his hands. He has literally beat this guy to death. Yeah. <laughs> and the cops are coming to haul him off, and you're like, oh, man, he's not going to get away. Yeah, I think a lot, a lot of his characters, and as we go through them, I think a lot of his characters get what's coming to them as well sure. if they've broken yeah. the law they're probably going right. to end up going to prison for it you know they're not john yeah. rambo or, or whoever who's killed a hundred people in nakatomi plaza and then 
you know, there's going to be consequences. Yeah, okay, you saved the J, John McLean, but you've also killed quite a lot of people. Um, we need to, <laughs> we need to get this sorted out. There's a lot yeah. of paperwork. <laughs> and that's what's different about it, right? Well, you kind of get the Rambo thing, right? Where they actually do kind of uh, capture him and bring him in, and that's that's kind of where it ends, you know. Versus a lot of, but like you said, uh, you just you just uh, killed about 500 people in this in this business building, and you know we. Don't hear anything about you till the next movie, but it's the same scenario again, right? <laughs> so yeah, Fist of Fury. Um, what a great first movie to kick off a career, man. This thing is just, it's really good. And again, it's low budget because again, you're you're pumping money into an unknown and just trying to get them a career started. You know that Bruce had a lot to do with what happens in this flick. So I don't know. I, I highly recommend Fist of Fury. It's one that I revisit quite often, believe it or not. Uh, mm. I guess because it's always that thing of, man, this is where it really started, right? It all started with this flick right here. Yeah, for sure. Brings us up to Chinese Connection. How do you, some of them are coming in, coming out. Uh, man, this one, when I see things about Bruce Lee on the internet or pictures and stuff, it's usually a picture or two from this movie. I was going to say, when there, there's a clip to be shown, <laughs> it's the clip where he's in the dojo and then he takes <laughs> uh, those 10 guys around him. It's more than that. <laughs> he, he does a series of kicks in one take. It's probably about 20 kicks, isn't it? And it's every type of kick you can think of. It's not the same kit. Right. It's insanely yeah. Yeah. athletic. And he it's wanted to show, you know, this is what I can do shot overhead right so you can so you can see what's going on it's just a stationary camera and people are just flying every direction <laughs> it's just incredible yeah. how about when he gets the two guys and they both grab his arm and he just picks them both up and starts spinning them and flings them across them? i Which, love and i know Bo ransel is a fan of a good dummy shot as well and that yeah. is a good dummy shot in a this great one yeah because <laughs> they're now, just definitely dummies <laughs> and one of those guys one of the guys that ends up does getting tossed is jackie chan that's right. Um, yeah. It's one of the guys that gets kicked through a window. Through a, through a window. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's right. That Jackie Chan was a very young, eager to please stuntman. Yeah. Worshipped Bruce Lee and said, um, "I'll do it." And they said, "All right, but we haven't got any pads or anything." He said, "I don't care. What have I got to do?" And they said, "We just want someone who can go as far as possible through a window and out the other side." So he just ran, <laughs> jumped through the window, no pads or anything. I don't think he really hurt himself, but. That guy just was like I'm eager to please. Yeah. Well, he was he was trained from childhood to to do that kind of work. I mean, you know, yep. the the whole acrobatic thing, you know, and learn how to take a fall. So. Uh, uh, what's interesting about this movie as well is this. I believe this was the first movie where Bruce fought a westerner. Um, yes. Yeah. He, he fights. Um. What's the guy's name? Uh, is uh, it? Big mustache dude. Yeah. He's, uh, well, I think he is it. Rob, I think it's Robert Baker that plays him. He's like a Russian guy. Isn't I think he? that's right. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. He's got a very big mustache. Isn't he? <laughs> but yeah, that was interesting to see. And again, this goes to Bruce Lee's philosophy of bringing everybody together. And you'll see this come in more and more and right. more uh, until he fights Chuck Norris. And then he's. Right. Well, I can't wait to talk about another dragon. But anyway, oh, yeah. that's, get we're, we're getting close. But yeah, well, in this one, too. And again, when I think about, again, the Bruce Lee shots that I see, I always see the, the thing where he does his hands and it's like yeah. multi-motioned kind of thing, which we've seen ripped off a million times. Yeah, it's even the kind of the Matrix. Yep. Did it here first, kind of man. Yeah. And this, this, this uh, synopsis as well for this movie is just yeah. literally... His teacher is killed, so he seeks vengeance. I mean, that is, is yeah. the most basic kung fu plot, yep. but it works. <laughs> yeah, this, this one really ties back into what we just talked about with all the Shaw Brother flicks, right? Where it's the evil, the, one of the evil uncles or something kind of kind of deal. But you got uh, two different dojos. Uh, you got Chinese, Japanese. Mm -hmm. They hate each other, and there's there's even some. Uh, some uh, racial talk about in this because there's a scene where he's trying to go to, I think it's a park, right? And there's a yeah. sign at the park that says no Chinese or dogs allowed. I know. You I know? know. And uh you know, and of course he does the thing where he jumps up and kicks the sign off the side of the wall and then kicks it in half, you know. And of course that brings out the cops, but the, the remember all the kids gather around him and pull him away. Yeah. You know, just kind of giving a little thing of, you know, well even even the Japanese when they come into the dojo 
they've got a sign that says what Chinese is the weak man of Asia or something yeah, like that. Sick man of Asia. Sick man of Asia. So he rips the sign up, doesn't he? And he, he stuffs Makes it down eat their it. throat. He's, yeah. Eat it! All yeah. of it! <laughs> Next time it'll be glass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, it's great. Great. And this is uh, the thing where, again, uh, you can look at, like you said, John McClane, all these characters definitely pull from this character development on this one as well. The whole ending shot where he's finally <laughs> taking care of business and you get the scene where he knows there's no way out. Yep. All the police are lined up with their guns and he just runs towards them and it stops with him jumping up in the air, freeze frame, and you hear the shots and that's just how it ends. It's iconic. It's iconic. Yeah, ending. It is. Uh, and weirdly, this scene was used in Game of Death. Yep. Uh, just to jump ahead to show his character being killed in Game of Death yeah, in, re- in real life, as in in that movie. And how ironic, that, right? I, exactly, because, of course, Brandon Lee died on the set of The Crow. And I know you you and Danny covered that not too long ago, actually. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, it, and Brandon Lee did die of gunshot wounds on set. And it's, it. just, it's just a very yeah. spooky urban myth, legend. Is it the Chinese mafia? Is it a curse? Is it all these... And that's another thing that comes to Bruce Lee. There's so much myth around him. Right. And his family, right. his whole family, yeah. you know. That, yeah, I mean, it, it, you're exactly right, because uh, there, there's a documentary called Curse of the Dragon. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you've ever checked that out or not. I've but got it, yeah, I've got it. It's, it ties all that stuff together, right? It's very, very interesting with Brandon's story and Bruce's and those things, it's just how they match up, and it's just so ironic that uh, – yeah, I mean, uh, how can you <laughs> how can you foresee that like that? That's crazy. Yeah. But uh, yeah, man, I I love I love Chinese Connection. I really do. Uh, I I just think it's uh, instead of it being an individual, you've got now a a a team, right? Your dojo, your your mm. martial arts family, you know, which is a just a different level. Your gang, if you will, right? Yeah. Your Cobra and, Kai. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and you know, that's what this comes down to is, is uh, you know, the name calling, the bullying. Hey, you know, we're learning martial arts for the right reasons. You guys are, you know, trying to take over and uh, somebody's got to put you back in your place. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, when you find out that when Bruce Lee comes back and he's visiting and you got to remember at this point, he is now a superstar in China. He is he is it. Right. So the second movie comes out, he's already that big. And he comes on the screen wearing that white jacket. Sharp as all get out, man. Yeah. I mean, he's kicking it. And he comes in there and finds out that, that his master is dead. You get the uh, the traumatic scene at the gravesite, right? Where he just loses it. Teacher! Teacher! <laughs> and the rain, the rain's pouring yeah. down. And then I think they knock him out with a shovel, don't they? Yeah, because... they do. Just get him to calm down. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've all been there. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't a slap to the face. It wasn't a you know, hair have some tea. It was a shovel to the head. <laughs> You're acting crazy to shut up. <laughs> You're disrespecting the gravesite. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. Great one. It is. I, I I love this movie. I love the music, too. Boom, boom. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, the music's great. And and even the um for all of these, you know, these uh, dung, dung. 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 As soon as you get the golden harvest, you're like goosebumps. This exactly. is going to be great. You yeah. know, it's either going to be a Bruce Lee or a Jackie Chan movie, or, or somewhere in the middle, and right. I'm going to love it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So yeah, man, that's Chinese Connection. Again, I, I recommend all these. There's probably one I probably won't recommend. We'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> mm, I think I know which one you're going <laughs> to. Now we get to. Where's it at? There it is. There it Return is. Return of the Dragon. Uh, I never get bored of this one either, man. This is your, this is the one you were talking about earlier where it's in Rome. Yep. Chuck Norris. I mean, come on, Chuck Norris and Bruce. What else do you need to know about this movie? You got Chuck Norris fighting Bruce Lee. In the Coliseum. In Rome. the Coliseum. <laughs> with a, with a spectator of one cat. <laughs> I don't know why that cat is there, but it is. Um, yeah. 
it's iconic though that scene but yeah. and the cat the cat just makes it iconic for some right. reason i don't know it's it's one of those things that, but um th- as i think i said this is i think this was the first movie i watched you know and it felt like i've been introduced to this really strange world because he meets a prostitute you know <laughs> but he's he's a, a fish out of water as much as i was watching sure. this i think that's why i really connected with it even when right. he's at the the restaurant and he doesn't realize you only have to order one item off the menu and they just bring him every type of soup and everything there is. And he, he does eat it all, but yeah. he just doesn't he doesn't really understand the customs. You know, he's a Chinese guy in Italy. What is going on? I don't understand. He's just there to visit a family who run a restaurant. Um, and he just yeah. gets involved in this. Uh... Yeah, he's got an uncle that owns a restaurant. Hint, hint. If you've been listening to the show already <laughs> <laughs> that he goes to stay with and get a job there and. Who could, live be, life. Who, who could, could be, be the bad guy? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, this is your typical, you know, kind of big boss thing as well, right? Because you got to have the bad guys that have to go hire people to get rid of this problem that they got, which is Bruce Lee. But he makes friends quickly with all of his cousins and everybody there that, that live there. And they go out in this back alley. There's a bunch of thugs that's out there that's basically you know doing the whole protection money thing with the place right and bruce goes out there and these other guys try to step up first that doesn't go too well no and then bruce gets in there and just floors them this is the first time his character character that he played was quite cocky yeah uh and he sort of says to his cousins and he sort of pats them on the chest and goes he doesn't even say anything he just sort of nods his head like leave this to me right yeah and these guys that he's about to take down they are slightly out of shape they're not exactly <laughs> in right. shape guys but you know they've got weapons and i think one of them's got nunchucks because he takes them off of them and, right and, and shows them how you really use a set right. of nunchucks. yeah this is the first time we get to see bruce using the nunchucks right oh, wow that then that blew me away and, and yeah they were banned in the uk for years you know um yeah it, so I I didn't see that the uncut version, the version I would have seen would have not had this bit in it. Um, you know, even Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was called Teenage Mutant <laughs> Hero Turtles in the UK uh, wow. up, up until about 15 years ago. And any any time Michelangelo uses nunchucks, it was cut out. Nunchucks was such a banned thing. And I don't yeah. know why. It wasn't like we all had them in the playgrounds. I don't know what was going on. But uh, it's really weird. So, yeah, when I went back when and you... watched the uncut <laughs> version of this, I was like, whoa. Wow, that's that's nuts because you think about I mean it's basically a nightstick just with a chain in the middle of it. I mean, <laughs> why was it that big of a threat? I, know, I mean, it's, I, it's weird. You know, I, that's that's kind of weird. It really is. Yeah. I didn't know that. It was the ninja craze, you know, the ninja craze sure. in the 80s. Yeah. People were bringing in like I had a kid in school that brought uh, there was a kid that brought in his uncle had made a throwing star. Ah. Uh, and obviously that's highly dangerous. He was trying to throw it at a tree to get it to stick. So the yeah. ninja craze started getting out of hand, particularly in the UK, I think. So the teachers were worried and then the press got hold of it. And before you knew it, Ninja Turtles were Hero Turtles and Bruce Lee wow. wasn't using his nunchucks. Wow. Now, see times. here that the ninja craze kicked in so much that you could walk down to any local like dollar store. <laughs> They'd have butterfly knives, throwing stars. Oh. You could get either real nunchucks or you could get the ones that had the foam covering instead. I mean... And it was no big deal. You'd see people at school, you know, with a handful of throwing stars, you know, and it, <sighs> at recess, they'd go outside and, like you said, go out and try to stick them in a tree or whatever. <laughs> it wasn't a big deal. But butterfly knives, everybody had one. Yeah, you I've know? always wanted one of those um, yeah. just to learn how to open and close them. Like I still think I've those. got mine somewhere. I have to I'd find probably, that. I think I'd lose a finger if I was to try and do well, what the cool guys do with it. Well, no, really, all it is to it is there's there's. There's one handle on it that you want to make sure that's the one you're holding when you're flipping it open. Because <laughs> the other side is what will get you cut, right? Okay. <laughs> you have to make sure you're using the right side. So, And the problem is, is that it wasn't standardized either. It could be either one. Oh, <laughs> you know? So you had to learn your knife, you know. Anyways. But yeah, man, come on. And I love that, you know, like you said, these Italian mobster dudes that are out here in the alleyway. The one guy even, the, you know, when the guy jumps up and starts doing his, you know, warm-ups for his karate moves and stuff he just kind of rolls his eyes at him <laughs> he does doesn't he like, <laughs> it's just gotta you go this ahead whole... do your thing if this is gonna make you feel any better <laughs> yeah but uh but yeah man like i said this is you know bruce is is full tilt boogie right here man he is top notch like you said he's a little cocky in this one 
there's one scene in particular that I always think of, and that's where he's in this room. I'm, I'm going to lose, you know, what's actually going on here, but I just remember that he's trying to get this girl to get out of the room because he knows that trouble's coming, and he jumps up and mm. kicks a hanging light. Wow. Which, when you look at it, you're like, how? It's like seven, <laughs> eight feet up. Yeah, straight up. It's, he don't take a running jump at it. He stands flat-footed, jumps up, kicks it out, and says, scram! He's superhuman. <laughs> It's just it's, unreal. It, it, it's it's towards it's getting towards the end, isn't it? That bit when he yeah. that's when he gets hold of the the very camp um, sort of second in command to, mm-hmm. the big, the, to the big boss, and and then of course, well, he's defeated all of our other henchmen. What what are we going to do? Fly in the American? Yeah, yeah. The 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 biggest name in American martial arts at the time, Chuck Norris. Whew. And. and that collar on his shirt when we first see him, that is a thing. <laughs> he could have just flew that shirt in. <laughs> I was going to say, he could hang glide with that thing. Um, I heard that Bruce Lee wanted to fight him in this because he wanted the contrast between a very hairy, brutish American and, uh, you know, Chinese guys normally don't have much hair, right. bodily hair. And, and he wanted to. So when Bruce Lee, when Chuck Norris showed up on set without his iconic beard and moustache, Bruce Lee was like, hang on a minute. I, <laughs> We hired you. So they, that's why there's so em- much emphasis on his chest hair right. in that fight scene, because they wanted to sort of keep a part of that alive. Right. Um, but you can imagine Chuck thinking, wow, I've got this. I better have a shave because I've got this film. This Bruce <laughs> I want to look good. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce Lee's thinking, I hope he's really hairy when he gets here. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you, you get a lot of first with this. And that's the thing about it. You're, you're three movies in with Bruce. And there's still a lot of firsts that are happening. The nunchucks first starts happening here, right? Mm -hmm. So already half through, if you want to say halfway through his career, is when we're starting to see this other stuff that just takes it to a whole different level. The use of of different weapons. Um, The physique, right, Mm -hmm. is really focused on in this movie. Not in the other one so much. But this is the one where you see him standing and he's he's stretching. And you see how wide his back gets when he's doing the stretch. And you're starting to go, wow. This guy is probably in better physical shape than anybody on this planet. And that kick he described as well, yeah. you know, who who can jump other than a fly or an ant? Who's got the strength to jump that high? Yeah. Yeah. You know, Marvel characters are doing that now with the aid of CGI, but this guy is just doing yeah. it, you know? He's doing it, yeah. And again, the, the battle with, with Chuck Norris is just super iconic. And what makes it so great is it's isolated, right? It's just... Mm. Me and, and the big baddie, you know, the, the the two top people, no crowd, isolated. It's just yeah. you and me, and we know this is going to end one way. And there's no no showing off. It's just like skill right. against skill, strength against right. strength. You know. And this this is also the introduction where Bruce Lee started really getting uh, influenced by Muhammad Ali with the footwork. Yes, he does some so, incredible footwork in this. Yeah. And you see him start, and then even you know when it starts working for him, then you see Chuck start trying to do it too. Yep. They don't work out so well. <laughs> it doesn't work out for him. Yeah, he starts almost skipping on the spot, doesn't he? And uh, right. the guy's almost like slightly levitating, you know, when he's yeah. doing that. Yeah. Um, and again, like uh, he kills Chuck Norris, his character. And how many times have you ever seen Chuck Norris die in a movie? Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it, he doesn't like doing it. Again, he don't want to do it. To that that John yeah. McQuaid thing is he doesn't really want to do it, but he, he has to because it's him or him. Yeah. To and he even tells he, him, you know, because he he broke his leg, he broke his arm, and he can't do anything. And he decides he's still going to come after him. And Bruce even looks at him and goes, "Don't do it, bro. We we'll yeah. stop right now." He's like, "I've I've already already broken about ten of your bones. Yeah. Let's just end this." But but Chuck's like, mm, "I've been paid yeah. to do this, and I my honor, etc. Cetera, etc." Cetera. So when he does kill him, he respects him for yeah. fighting to the end. So he places his his gi, his um, martial arts right. top over him, and sort of looks at him and sort of thinks, "Yep." Yeah. Yeah, and then and that's the end. Yeah, he kills him in the Coliseum. It's... Yeah, but like I said, when it comes down to it, you find out that the evil uncle is in shenanigans with the main bad guy, and that brings it all down to you know breaking up the band. <laughs> oh, uncle, uncle, uncle! Why must you do it? Uh, so yeah, man, Return of the Dragon. Again, I can say this about all of them; they're all all pretty much my favorites, you know. But. uh Again, that that one just really sets wheels in motion for what's to come. So, how does Bruce get any bigger? 
<laughs> you team up with Warner Brothers, and you make the most iconic martial arts flick of all time, Enter the Dragon. And, you know, if you have not seen Enter the Dragon, then why are you listening to this podcast? <laughs> it, it, it is iconic in every way, from from the cast, which we'll get we'll get into. Robert Kleist, the director, yeah. the background extras, the the script. Uh, Lalo Schifrin's score is. I still listen to it to this day. It's still over and over. I've got the CD of it, and I love the score. Yeah, you know, Lalo Schifrin is an incredible um, composer. Anyway. Um, Mission Impossible, he did as well, didn't yep. he? Mm-hmm. Um, and then he went on to do the Rush Hour soundtrack, which I love. It's very, it sounds a lot like the Under sure. the Dragon. It's just everything about this movie. Yeah. And then again, it's Bruce's philosophy of bringing together, because it was originally called, I believe, Triangle of Steel or something like that. Yeah. Um, uh, and it, it it went through a series of different names. And the three main heroes in this is a white American, a Chinese guy, and a black American. So you've got three different races all joining forces to take down this, you know, this society, this Mortal Kombat style yeah. arena of death. And it's just, you've never seen anything like it. Yeah, it's brilliant. And and you get the whole setup where, you know, Bruce is this undercover agent, really. He's a, he's a hired by these guys. And how many movies have you seen? I mean, even currently where you get hired, you're brought into this room, they show you a bunch of slides. Here's the castle. Here's the wall. Here's the bad guy. You know, that's your introduction. I mean, I can I can name 40 movies yeah. <laughs> that have that. Even the newest Suicide Squad. You know, they're all sitting there in that little room. They're showing them the slides of what they got to do, where they got to go. Getting briefed on everything, right? It's a military operation that Bruce is doing here. And it's just iconic. <laughs> and he actually says, oh, I'm not really interested in doing this. Why can't somebody else do it? <laughs> Right. <laughs> and then they reveal to him, because, Bruce, you know your sister that died, this guy's henchman was the one that did it. Yeah, this is the guy that did it. So they right. know what's going to push his buttons and get him on board on this mission. <laughs> <laughs> have, you, have you ever seen Kentucky Fried Movie? Uh, a couple of times, a long time ago. Because yeah. they do a whole spoof on this, yeah, right? that's right. And there's, he, there's, there's a thing, it's like, after they show him the slides, he goes, so any question? He goes, yeah. Why me? I mean, I'm not interested in any of this. I owe my allegiance to a higher source. And he goes, yeah, but you get the chance to kill 50, maybe 60 people. He's like, (laughs) oh. (laughs) Cool. I'm in. Where do I sign? (laughs) I mean, come on, man. Black Belt Jones, uh, Jim Kelly. Jim Kelly. Man, you come straight out of a comic book. I mean, John Saxon. Mr. Handman. Some of those lines are just... Uh, the scene where Jim Kelly's like, uh, the woman brings in some ladies for him to keep him company. And she's like, who would you like? And he picks seven women. Uh, please understand if I missed anybody out. I've had a busy day and I'm yep. a little tired. I'm a little tired. <laughs> wow. But I mean, yeah, then, of course, our favorite, jo- John Saxon. You know, yeah. If John Saxon's in a movie, it's a movie worth watching most Absolutely. of the time. Absolutely. Hands down. You don't even have to question it. <laughs> he fought Freddy Krueger in a scrapyard once. Yep. So you need to know. So yeah, anything he's in, man, I'm uh, instantly I'm gonna check it out. It's just gonna happen. But uh, yeah, man, again, this is the most iconic movie. The art of fighting without fighting. You know, there's yep. so many things in this movie that are just <sighs> we've seen ripped off so many times. He, he developed his philosophy fully by this movie which was the yes. art of fighting without fighting you know Jeet Kune Do, the way of the intercepting fists is what that means so he was very keen for this to showcase yeah not just what he could do but what he believed in as well which again was bringing people together um, and all these different styles you know John Saxon's fighting style is very different oh yeah Jim, Jim Kelly's is very brutal a lot of fists yeah. and then you've got Bruce Lee who's this crazy uh, flexible so fast it's unreal some of those i mean i quite often i've just watched the last half an hour of this movie just because it's just yeah yeah it's top notch man it's top notch and again if you've ever seen a movie where there's a martial arts competition going on on an island they took the idea from this movie (laughs) it's it's that simple and uh the speed 
that Bruce shows in this man when he when he gets his hands up and this is the guy that's that's responsible for his sister's death mm-hmm. and it keeps flashing to him think of that the speed of him snapping and and hitting him in the face is just so unbelievable and there's but people that, say oh well, they sped that up I don't think they did I think no, that's just apparently the actor slows down some of his stuff yeah um yeah yeah he he does that little one inch punch and he also um, he heard that there was some press on set, one of the scenes who were doubting his strength. They said it's all show. So he gave a couple of the stuntmen a few extra hundred dollars each. And the scene where he kicks a horror, yeah. Uh, yeah. He, ki- he said, I'm going to kick you really hard. and I'm going to kick you into the stuntmen because I want to show this these press. So he did. And it broke two of the st- arm, yeah. arms of the stuntmen because he kicked the guy so far back. It's yeah. unreal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, again, that that curse of the dragon where James Coburn is talking about the punching bag that he had hanging back there it was a hundred pound punching bag. Mm. And Bruce was telling him to, to draw back and kick it using all your power. And then when, when Coburn did it and it didn't satisfy him, he said, no, do it like this. And he said it literally snapped the chain. Mm-hmm. And he said that bag disintegrated in the backyard. He said it fell to pieces. He said, that's how strong Bruce Lee was. So, and, and a lot of that is on display here, you know, I mean, so how do, you know, that's, that's why it had to be hard to live in his shoes, right? Because everybody wanted to challenge him. He said, there'd be people jumping over the wall at his house and standing Mm. in his backyard. You know, you know, he was just one of a kind. And, uh, I read a thing where Joe Weider, you know, big famous athletic you know bodybuilder guy yeah he said that that bruce would write him letters all the time and talk about these new things that he figured out with his with his strength and he said he would do this thing where he would take 50 pounds 55 pound dumbbells or 50 pound dumbbells and would just punch with them and joe weeder's like i know professional bodybuilders that have done this their whole life that can't hold 50 pounds out like this you know (laughs) and he's punching with it you know and then he also, I don't know if you've ever seen this or not, but you ever, you ever seen him do the flag? Uh, One of his favorite exercises, he would get up against a pole, and he'd grab his hands around the pole oh, yes, and, yeah. and lift his body up vertical, uh, horizontally in the air, and then start making his body do this Yeah. To, to for core strength. And Joe Weider was like, how's that even possible? Because there's a scene in this where he goes down a rope and keeps mm-hmm. his legs completely straight because yeah. he's trying to be ninja silent you know as he yeah. enters this underground lair where they're making all the opium and the heroin and everything you know and he's and that's what that's the other thing i love about this is that you've got that whole that whole plot is great this whole underground yeah. secret evil lab that that you know where they're trying out this drug on all these homeless people and he releases them all at the end, and this causes this gigantic war between like all the prisoners of the island and, and all the henchmen. And it's just yeah, yeah. it's it's it, it's a Bond flick. I mean, let's let's oh, face it. Yeah. This is this is set up like a James Bond flick. You just put the martial arts thing in there to get Bruce Lee in here and and start giving him some some credibility in America or universally. Uh, yeah, it's 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 the perfect stage for him. It's the perfect story. Uh. Again, we've seen it a million times since then. Everybody's borrowed from this. Uh, I recently covered uh, uh, crap. I just lost it. Uh, Treasure of the Four Crowns. Mm-hmm. You know, if you remember me covering that, it's it's a remake of, of it's 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 this it's this movie without the martial arts. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's so, definitely uh, it definitely changed movies, and it yes. also again for bruce his legacy it did what he wanted to do which is it put a chinese face on an international screen absolutely and people already knew who he was like yourself like you mentioned but people just your average joe who maybe not didn't know kung fu movies or or anything they would know bruce lee because of enter the dragon you know this movie made him an action icon and and then transcended like i said earlier into this whole He's something else now. He's just yep. something else. Yep. And again, similar to, to Brandon with The Crow, you know, he died before we got, really got to see what this movie did for him. Right. And right. and it's a real shame, but also it's a hell of a way 
to to go out really you know yeah. what what a legacy that he'll be remembered for and right. obviously there is one more movie which i know yeah. we're probably going to touch on in a minute but enter the dragon like i said i'll say it again it is the best martial arts movie of all time really yep yeah no no argument here at all and let's 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 just face it you know again the shaw brother movies and other stuff they've been out a long time but there's no doubt they are even more popular now because people got so into the Bruce Lee movies, they started revisiting, right? We started getting Kung Fu theater on on weekends, on TV yep. and stuff. And it's all because of Bruce Lee mania. That's really mm-hmm. where it started. I, I, people wanted more and more and more and right. more and more Kung Fu. Look at all the Bruce Lee clones that we got out of that, right? Uh, Bruce Lai, Bruce Lowe, Bruce yeah. Lee, you know, yeah. Jackie Chan was marketed initially as another Bruce Lee until he said, right. I don't want to be another Bruce Lee. I want right. to be Jackie Chan. I want to be my yeah. so, And everybody was going, he's the next Bruce Lee. He's the next Bruce Lee. This guy's the next Bruce Lee. You know, you hear it all the time. Yeah. But even he knew I wasn't the next Bruce Lee. I mean, you know, <laughs> he's a totally different thing. Right. And yeah. I mean, come on, you got to love Jackie too, but he even knew that that's just a different level altogether. Uh, and that's not where Jackie's heart was, right? He's 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 an entertainer. Yeah, he's he's more family man, uh, comedy like family movies, comedy, yeah. and he's an acrobat as well. Right, he, Buster he, Keaton, modern exactly. time Buster Keaton, Charlie you know. Chaplin. He they were some of his favorite actors, but Buster yeah. Keaton, Charlie Chaplin, Howard Lloyd are his three favorite actors. Yeah. You know, you can see it. Uh, you can see it in what in his work that stuff. Yeah. All right. So again, we can go on and on about Enter the Dragon. <laughs> it's just the best. We got one more. So Bruce Lee died before Enter the Dragon even came out in the theaters. Mm. So again, a huge shame that he didn't see how this changed martial arts history forever. But because it was such a big movie and because of the name and the controversy, we get, there it is in there, Game of Death. Mm. Now, this one is an odd one because Bruce is only in about 15 minutes of it. (laughs) <laughs> yeah it's a if, if that so the backstory for this one for any of your listeners that don't know he started making this movie before he was approached by warner brothers to make right. um you know what he Enter considered to be uh you know the, his biggest chance enter the dragon yeah so he started filming got together with a bunch of his students and friends um you know kareem abdul jabbar uh, Danny Santo, who is an amazing um, yep. martial artist, and a few other people, and he had this idea, and it's, this is like a video game, you know, mm-hmm. he had this idea of, I don't know what the plot is yet, but the end of this movie is going to be a guy, me, Bruce Lee, goes up this pagoda, and every level I have to fight a different type of martial arts till I get to the very top level, which is going to be this insane, huge fight, but every level I'm going to work my way up, and he filmed yeah. some of that, and then like you say, Warner Brothers called, Robert Klaus called, come make this movie with John Saxon. So he did, then he died. This footage is sitting around for a few years. What are we going to do with this footage, Ricky? Well, we got we got all this Bruce Lee footage. What should we do with it? What if we find a guy that looks like Bruce Lee and we'll make up a whole bogus story and somehow tie it into the end of the movie? Got it. Let's do it. I like it. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, we are fortunate to have it, right? Because let's face it, those fight scenes – Going up the pagoda is amazing. It's Especially amazing. Especially if you get the uncut sort of stuff yes. with the nunchucks. And the fight yeah. with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, although Kareem is not an amazing fighter, he was taught by Bruce Lee. And his sheer height, right. Bruce is showing you how he can take down an opponent who's almost twice his height, you know? Right. He kicks him in the head at one point. Right. And that's, <laughs> that's, and that's that thing, again, of the mindset of what Bruce Lee was trying to teach is there is no one style. It's the yep. integration of everything that makes you who you are in life, mm-hmm. in your career, in everything, martial arts. It's not one style. It's being acceptant to other things and learning new things and adapting it only makes you stronger. We hear that all the time. Case point, that's what his whole career was about. That's what he was trying to teach, you know, is all these things you need to be acceptable of because it's only going to make you stronger. You can take that to any kind of philosophy you want to. That's what he was teaching, right? Pretty yep. basic. Um, but yeah, we are fortunate to have this footage. And the rest of it just kind of leaves you going, 
yeah, I know that's not Bruce. We get the we get the famous yellow and black jumpsuit. Yeah, is the thing I come away with in this one that, you know, he was in top form too, man. These fight scenes, he's he's on he's hitting on all cylinders, man. Yeah, he he was at probably at his peak along with then to the dragon in this really his physical yeah. peak. And, and and I tell you, when I was a kid, I wanted a pair of those yellow A6 oh, sneakers yeah. that he wears in this. I couldn't get them in the UK, but if I could have got hold of a pair of those, yeah. probably not the jumpsuit. I don't think I could have pulled that off. But, um, <laughs> But then probably when I was a 10 year old, I would have loved to have worn that. But um, so yeah, if, you folks, uh, if you folks don't know what yellow ju- jumpsuit we're talking about, just go back and watch Kill Bill. I was going to say Kill Bill or go back and watch um, my one of my favorites, The Last Dragon. The Last Dragon. Yes. Bruce Leroy. Bruce, <laughs> Bruce Leroy. Leroy. That's why I said it. Bruce Leroy wears a, a, a yellow jumpsuit in that because his, his, his hero is Bruce Lee in that, which is right. crazy. Yeah. So, yeah. That yellow jumpsuit is very iconic, isn't it? Yeah. But yeah, I was with you on the shoes, man. I'm matter of fact, I'm an Asics guy, and it, yeah, I could I like say it goes shoes. all the way back to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but but like you say that we they they mishmash this movie. Yeah. You know, it's um, a it's a mess. It's not really an enjoyable movie to watch. I literally just go to the part where he's fighting and kind of skip the rest because they they created this. Uh, he gets killed on the movie set. They take old. Yeah. They take they find every piece of footage that they can piece together. It's almost like Roger Corman was making this movie, right? Yeah. Like a little bit of this, a little bit of this, and try to try to make something out of it. Coherent. And then they got um, they get Dean Jagger in and a few other people to sort of play these extra characters. Right. Uh, there's even a scene, and I'm not even kidding, guys. There's a scene where the guy that is playing Bruce Lee, which they shoot a lot of him from the back or with a motorcycle helmet on sometimes. Yeah. But there's a scene where he's wearing a mask of Bruce Lee and it's not not a latex mask because this was the 70s we're talking a cut out <laughs> cardboard mask just for a few seconds in the scene right uh, and you think who was accepting that this was really Bruce Lee <laughs> <laughs> the lost movie you've never seen it before we found it yeah <laughs> no, no this isn't a lost movie is it Come right on. it's a lost movie all right <laughs> it, it should be lost <laughs> Yeah, and again, I mean, it, it really comes down to that. I think it's even like 12 minutes of footage. It's all you really get. But, uh, you know, again, we're fortunate to see that. And and um, that's the weakest movie of the bunch. Yeah. And, and it's not to the fault of Bruce Lee. It's to yeah, the it, fault it, of... And, it's, and if you're a Bruce Lee fan and you've checked all the others out, it's a, it's a curiosity that I, I would actually say, just, just to give it a watch, you know. Sure. Yeah, yeah, as a completist, you have to watch it. But you do feel like, man, this is just a cash grab, you know, mm-hmm. more than anything else. And there was uh, a game of death too, as well, which um, obviously they had no footage left. So this is just completely uh, another guy playing the same character. Um, right. And it's completely unrelated. Yeah. But you know me, I have to watch every sequel of everything I've ever watched. <laughs> so one more thing to throw at you when we're talking about this. Did you ever see the movie Circle of Iron? So that is that David Carradine. David Carradine, yeah. Yeah, and that was um, another version of Enter the Dragon, was it not? It's it, well, it's it's that same philosophy of integrating fighting styles, right? So it's basically Bruce Lee was gonna. This is a story he wrote. Yeah, that's right. And, and he was gonna be in it, and Car- Carradine plays mainly the bad guys in it. There's a different guy. I can't think of the guy's name. That's the star, and he's just a big kind of bulky. Conan trying to look and you know kind of guy for the time, and but that's what it is. He ends up fighting all these adversaries, and they all have these complete different fighting styles. And one of them's like almost like a monkey man, right? So it, you're mm. going back to like uh, Master of the Flying Guillotine, right? When they had the tournament there, and it's, you got the guys with the long stretchy arms, and yeah, it, it's it's that kind of mentality, but from more of a Bruce perspective of. You know, at the end of it, the only way you're going to win is by knowing that you have to combine all these styles to create what's going to be the ultimate style to to defend yourself. And, uh, you know, it's it's a it's an OK flick. It's better when you realize. Imagine Bruce Lee being in the role because that's what he intended. And, uh, you know, between that and you think about Kung Fu, again, just about to say David Carradine thing there, too. So. Yeah, David Carradine stole some thunder from Bruce there sure, a couple of sure. times, you know, yeah. and it's very strange how that worked out, really. 
Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of interesting things, things that we haven't touched on that we, you know, we won't go into now. But stuff like the the whole Green Hornet thing, how he found out when mm-hmm. he when he came to China and, and Hong Kong, he realised that over there they called it the Cato Show because. <laughs> because he it was, was the they, star. They tuned in for him. They, yeah. they didn't tune in for the other guy. They tuned in for him. Well, let's face it. When you watch it, that's the only person that you're like, wow, look at that guy go, right? Well, they started giving him more lines, and, you know, yeah. he was a little powerhouse and that, wasn't he? You know, he'd yeah. show up, and you always knew, don't worry, but the Green Hornet might pull out a gun, but Kato's going to take <laughs> take control of everything that's happening here. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Bruce, what, a, what an absolute legend. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. And his movies, I, I would say they get my least favorite is the first one, but only because yeah. it's the first one. They get sure. better. You know, yeah. it's not a bad move. None of them are bad. They right. get better. Yeah. And it's that, you know, for me, it's that you know, they're, they're all a soft spot, right? Because uh, just so enthralled with who he was, the character. Uh, yeah, man, I just, I, I love them. And, and they don't get as, as tropey as, a lot of your older, regular styled martial arts flicks where they get pretty predictable, right? Mm. And these, you know, he was taking the legendary stories but put them in modern times. And I think that's what really made it work. And it's very relatable. Uh, even as awesome as he was, he still made you feel like he was just a normal guy trying to find his way, you know? Yeah, for sure. For sure. Out of that tied in with the whole mystery element and the life cut short. And there's only these five movies available, really. Yeah. yeah. It's just this like, yeah. If if you know, you know, and there is the magic, right. and we we have we love the magic of Bruce Lee, right. you and I, and and there's a lot of people out there that do. And if you know, you know, man, you feel it. Like right. there's just something about him and his right. movies. It's just special. And he was a special person. It's that time frame in his life too, because we all know, you know, as you know, people it was oh, if he would have lived, imagine what he could have done if he lived. Well, he would have probably lost that fame after a while because you get older <laughs> he would have done an elvis you know what yeah, I mean? Li- life takes over you know you you can't have a normal life uh your movies are going to start faltering because it, it just becomes the movie company's trying to make a money grab mm-hmm. and you do them just because you're contracted to do them you know eventually you're going to make some movies that are not great and yep. it's going to hurt your career and things start spiraling after that you know uh yeah you're right he would have pulled an elvis i I really do think so because he was already heading that that, heading that direction anyways right Mm. based on what you believe what happened to him yeah uh i I think the fame was already getting to him to where it was distracting him Uh, he was paranoid he was getting you know he he was he'd become a father as well you know a second time you know when shannon was born uh and he was sort of protective of them as well you know and as well as his his wife Uh, and yeah how do you try like you said how do you live a life where you're protecting your wife and children (laughs) and earning this money and obviously you can protect anybody if you're Bruce Lee but it is difficult to to do that and and let's not forget he was punishing himself daily through his physical routines he was putting himself through you know, yeah. they said they said when he when his body was um brought in after he died that he had like the body of an 18 19 year old man in peak physical yeah. condition and he was in his 30s right. it's just yeah, yeah. <sighs> he, he pushed it he pushed it to a whole different boundaries that i don't think we've seen anybody else do no and again he 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 found out how to get him get the most out of his body and we're, we're just we're still not at that level yet you know he was just ahead of it, and it meant that much to him, you know, which along with that, you know, even being a father and stuff, you know, it couldn't have been a normal family life by any no, means. No. So it had to be hard, you know, but uh, and I, I'm speaking that from a child's point of view, a wife's point of view. How do you live with somebody that's this big, this iconic that, you know, eats, sleeps and, and, and dreams martial arts and movie making? Yep. You know, how can you have a normal life with that? You know, they, you know, they even the scenes where they said that it got to where he couldn't do as much working out because he was busy with all the filmmaking that he started doing the electrical shocking things. Right. Yeah. And they yeah. said that he would be shocking himself and editing film <laughs> at the same time working on stuff. So, I mean, you hear all these things If they're all true. Who knows? But I know that he was that obsessed. With... If he could have cloned himself, he would have done. Yes, wouldn't he? <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So. 
All right, man. I, I don't know what else to, to, to say here, except, uh, you know, if if you haven't been a fan of Bruce Lee and you're wondering what we're talking about, just go check these movies out. They're pretty much anywhere. You can find them everywhere. Yeah. Uh, but I only recommend the the Golden Harvest and, of course, uh, Enter the Dragons. Don't don't go looking at all the Bruce Lee clones. No. You know, uh, make sure it's legit Bruce Lee stuff. And there's not that many. Right. There's what we say, five I think total. Five. Yeah. So. Do yourself a favor. Oh, also, if you get the box set, there's also a uh, Bruce Lee the Legend. Yes, I've got that. That's the that's same box well. set I've got. <laughs> yeah. And that's a great documentary, and it really talks about those years in, in the Golden Harvest stuff. So there's that's a great a, doc. a really great documentary on Disney uh, Plus or Stars uh, with on Disney Plus for anyone who's got that called b walter yes which is a, a very good one where they they interview a lot of actors that are still alive that worked with him uh, and there's even some quotes from his daughter uh, and and his wife linda who passed away a couple of years ago i believe now uh, his ex-wife linda um because she remarried uh, and that's a very good documentary and it i've seen i'm sure you're the same rick i've probably seen a dozen maybe more bruce lee documentaries because he's one of the most yeah. documented people you know in yeah. film but this b water i'd not seen a lot of this stuff in there or not heard some of the anecdotes so if mm. anybody's interested i really recommend that as well um yeah a lot more philosophical in it uh, yeah. i've seen you know there's a lot of clips from that that i've seen the actual whole interview that he does where yeah. they captured a lot of stuff so then and that's uh you know you got that stuff you got the thing where he went to the uh taekwondo convention where yep. he, that's where he demonstrated his body strength the one his hand one, or the one inch one punch, finger push one ups. finger punch, yeah <laughs> oh crazy so but yeah yeah he, he's he's a legend folks i mean he, i know you already know that but you need to know why yeah. And that's the reason we're talking about this and just the impact it had on everything since every action flick, every martial arts flick. It, yeah. So much of it comes from this guy. Changed movies. He changed philosophy, changed martial arts. And he, he changed. He did change the way people look at race, I think, as well. Sure. Sure. Um, which is what he wanted to do, really. You, you guys, have you ever heard the song? Everybody was Kung Fu fighting. <laughs> that happened because of Bruce Lee. Yeah, he was responsible uh, for a massive craze that happened in yep. the 70s and 80s, that, which then led into canon films saying, let's just make loads <laughs> of ninja movies. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It all, again, it all ties into each other, man, no doubt. Uh, <laughs> well, Dan, that's, uh, that's a pretty good wrap up for, for all these flicks, man. Uh, yeah. That's a lot of fun. I feel like I've been 10 rounds with Chuck Norris myself <laughs> after that. Did you pull any chest hair out, though? Oh, all of it. And the, but there's a, a cat that's been watching us the entire time, and I don't know why. <laughs> wait, well, waiting for whoever dies so it gets to eat. That cat's pretty skinny, man. Do you think that's what he was going to do? He's going to just eat Chuck Norris's face after Bruce Lee walks out. <laughs> hey, don't worry, folks. We got some fresh Chuck tonight. <laughs> <laughs> he gets all his kittens. <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right, man. Uh, Dan, again, man, I, I appreciate you coming on. It's always a blast getting together and talking with you, man. And uh, uh, we'll see what comes up next. You kind of brought up a cannonball run. We'll see if yeah. we can I can get that in the works. Yeah, I'd love it. I'd love to come back. I love being on your show, uh, and I love just talking Bruce Lee. So yeah. th thanks for letting me just unleash my love of Bruce. <laughs> Well, I remember, I think it was on Hell Ming. I said, I live my life by three Bruces. <laughs> Bruce Lee, Bruce the Shark, and Bruce Campbell. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that does sum you up. <laughs> That's pretty much me in a nutshell, man. Very similarly, and this will be the last thing I say, I promise, because I, I talk a lot. My dad said to me yesterday, if you could invite any three people to a dinner, you know, the, the usual question, yeah. you know, who would you invite to dinner to have amazing conversation? And mine are the three Lees, Stanley, yeah. Christopher Lee, and Bruce Lee. For some wow. reason, uh, very coincidentally, those three would be, because they would all have some fantastic anecdotes and ways of looking at life. So that's who I would choose. But you've got the Bruces yeah. and I've got the Lees. So when I'm thinking of that scenario, I'm like, the one that probably would talk the least, but would have the most to say would be Christopher Lee. Yeah. Dude's been in what? Talk, he, he would listen when you talk. 400 when movies? Talk. I mean. <laughs> and he's also like 
been a secret agent for the the, U, yeah. the you know the British government <laughs> and done all these strange things that behind the scenes it'd just be oh, a great dinner that's incredible you Man. can come if I ever make it work okay I, yeah. I get a, make a time machine and bring can bring people back from the dead you're I'll, invited I'll get you I'll over. save up for a plane ticket <laughs> <laughs> I'll just get you, I'll use my machine to get you here don't oh worry. there you go yeah <laughs> man I appreciate you coming on anytime always a blast all right, folks, we're going to cut you loose. I know it's been a little long episode, but you know what? We covered a lot of ground here. And uh, hope you enjoyed this. Keep checking stuff out. Like I said, make sure you check out all the Dan stuff as well. He's he's on several formats. Uh, podcast on Haunted Hill. Blame it on yeah. aliens. You got it. And, uh, yeah, definitely check them out, folks. With that, we will check you later. Sayonara.